what are you doing that's different? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today we are joined by Brian Wakelin, a seasoned architect who has been shaping the profession since 1989. Co-founder of Public in 2008, Brian has a firm known for its collaborative spirit and exceptional problem solving. Under his leadership, Public has garnered numerous prestigious accolades, including recognition from the Society of Colleges and University Planning, the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects and the Architectural Institute of British Columbia, where they've won an incredible six times. In 2012, they were named the AIBC's Emerging Firm of the Year, followed by the Canada Council for the Arts Prix de Rome in 2015 and the Robert Ledigan Award in 2017. Brian is a trusted advisor renowned for his ability to bring together diverse voices and achieve consensus on complex projects, particularly in education, First Nation and institutional contexts. He's also a prolific writer and speaker with work featured in Design Quarterly, Spacing and more. Beyond his practice, Brian has given back to the architectural community through advisory roles and teaching at UBC's School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. In this episode, we will be discussing the importance of the role of design director and how design can be facilitated through other people. We look at working with multi-headed corporate clients and how uh, Brian is able to get consensus on complex projects. And we talk about winning work and marketing and how to move into sectors which you haven't worked in before. So loads of gold here. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Brian Wakelin. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Brian, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Really great to have you on the show. You're an architect. You're a co-founder of Public, which is a multidisciplinary design practice. And you're working at this very interesting kind of crossover between architecture and communication and media. You've worked in architecture for over 25 years. You've got a degree from uh, from British, British Columbia. I know that you like to consider yourself a, a deep generalist, somebody who moves from uh, knowledge silo to knowledge silo. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a very, it's a very unique uh, proposition as well, that some of the work that you guys do at, at public. So perhaps we'll start there and, uh, you know, how would you explain or describe the kind of work that you do at public architecture? Sure. sure. Um... So yeah, it's a multidisciplinary firm, um, and the firm is engaged in matters of public significance, I suppose. Um, at this time, in this part of the world, as in many parts of the world, there are uh, lots of issues um, that are affecting our society at large, whether that be housing affordability, whether that be dealing with the colonial past, whether that be dealing with um, a, a whole myriad of social issues and issues uh, accelerated by climate change uh, as well. And we find ourselves in the middle of that in all kinds of different project types. Um, and so, you know, our, I suppose something we always filter, the work we do will, whatever this particular endeavor is, will we have the most, how can we have the most impact for the most people is, is really the goal. Um, and so that takes us into all kinds of places, doing all kinds of different things. So, so a lot of um, housing, education, kind of traditional um, building typologies. And there's a lot of civic work that's that's there. What's the sort of DNA that links all of these different types of projects? How would you best describe that? 
yeah, some days I, I wonder how that all threads together myself. Um, it uh, I, at public, we do a lot of things for of actually a very small group of uh, clients. It, it, we generally are highly serviced in for different groups of people that build a lot. That's one of the things that I suppose we set out uh, at the beginning to try to find organizations that could affect big change, whether they be governments or or quasi-governments like universities or, or things like that. And that allows us to suppose in one way offer full service, but what that means also is we are able to do lots of different things within that organization. So that, that thread is sometimes uh, an interesting amount of influence and opportunity in ways that, you know, when I graduated from architecture school and I thought this is what I'm going to do and it'll be, I don't know, uh, things that will make all of the design mags in the meet at, at that time. Um, and in some ways the kind of influence or, or the ways we've permeate through organizations, I find every day surprising, um, and encouraging to be honest. I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't realize, you know, it at the time in my education, one of my, uh, great mentors said, as an architect, you know, you can't do very much. You don't actually control the capital. You're not in control of the entire operation. You certainly have influence, you have voice, you have a lens, but ultimately it's somebody else's uh, uh, check, right? So how are you going to, and, and he would challenge me to find a way for, for influence. And, you know, I would say 25 years later that actually I'm, I'm surprised by the kinds of modes of, of influence we have, despite, you know, we're obviously having to balance clients' needs and, and, and ultimately it's, they're the ones, um, paying the bills and, 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 you know, guiding the, the lens, if you will, in, in some mm-hmm. respect, but it, it, uh, has been an encouraging kind of path. So there's just a, I suppose, a little bit of a hand or a constant influence from us to, um, our clients of, ooh, that might be interesting. And we helped you, uh, uh, puzzle through that particular problem or, or what it is. So it's, Wait, it's not a great answer. It's not, it's not a great aisle answer or not a great, um, well, you, you, you mentioned something very interesting there, actually, this kind of, that there are, there are lots of these different modes of influence that the architect can have on, on the client or in the kind of, um, production of, of the, the built environment. Could you talk a little bit more about some of the more non-traditional modes of influence that you see that architects or architecture has and that your practice um, kind of engages itself in? Yeah. Um, so one characteristic of our clients is there tend to be large organizations that move slowly and have lots of internal processes. Some might say internal politics, but I, I don't think that's a fair statement. I think there's just due process mm-hmm. required. And as an architect or an outsider to that organization, you have the ability to observe without filter in some ways. You're a consultant. You're there just, you've been brought in for ultimately action, um, ultimately to give a, a, a third party lens um, and to stir the pot might be one way to look at it or just, just help see things and say things that somebody within an organization may not feel empowered to do. Um, and you know, as an outsider, you bring in that lens of, look, this is what we're seeing in the industry. This is what um, multiple clients doing similar kinds of things are themselves seeing. So you bring that kind of lens of, of expertise from um, across a, a multiple jurisdictions or, or whatever it is. So that, that can help kick the ball down the field in organizations that might otherwise go lowly. That, I think that's quite interesting as well. You know, certainly when you're working with a, a more complex, multi-headed, perhaps a corporate client or an institutional client, there's often these organizations become quite large in themselves and their own internal communication processes are mm-hmm. what you might expect. And then the architect comes in and the architect is positioned in this quite unique position to be able to help a large entity like that self-reflect or even yeah. take an audit of the different parts of it or you know you're talking about a university there are different departments that are not won't have um traditionally spoken um yeah. with themselves or with each other for a long period of time you might yeah. have decision making processes 
inside of these yep. organizations that are antiquated and the architect comes in and the first thing you actually got to figure out is how can we how can we help these guys yeah. one communicate to each other and two actually make meaningful decisions yeah yeah I, I suppose a lot of things i find in in the beginning of a conversation of if a, there's something that's stuck I, I i may uh this is what your peers are doing that's a very valuable statement and it's a statement that is not right. easily done by somebody internally they may not be aware or they may not be uh have that kind of level of power within an organization to say that they may feel that they, they cannot voice that kind of opinion and and you know as soon as you say that it may stick or it may not and and for that particular organization they're like well that's what the other guys are doing that's fine that's not us we're this way great that's that's fine but at least this you know a duty to inform and 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 hope that um you know ultimately the best of what all the various peers are doing uh rises to the top and help uh make some significant change when it's needed. Mm -hmm. so how did you found the company? And and did you move straight when you kind of first started the the organization? Did you immediately go into working on these larger scale types of projects? Or did you have more of a kind of small practice startup scenario doing private residential and then one thing led to another and you you found your way into these into these traditionally very difficult sectors to get into yeah um great question so um i never imagined myself at the beginning of my career that i would have a firm i just it, it didn't uh wouldn't say it was daunting or intimidating it just li it literally didn't occur to me as a thing that i would do um my family, my my father and and my brothers, have all been in public sector work. My father was a planner and an architect, and and was in civic planning. Um, and my my brothers are professionals, foresters and engineers, and they they work um, in uh, municipal government to to do their thing. And I I suppose in some ways that's always a bit of a filter. You know, what's what's what did you grow up with? Um, then after you know going through after my education, I spent uh, a decade working for a, a big corporate firm, a multinational um, firm. And so I was exposed to lots of different project types. Um, it was a really great kind of mentorship and, and a upbringing, if you will. Um, yeah, and there was definitely two kinds of projects that I would characterize that I was involved with. Um, there was uh, a lot of uh, market sector work, um, private sector uh, housing, um, Vancouver, Western North America, there's lots of speculative building that, that takes place as in other cities. Um, and that was a certain kind of work and, and was part of my world. And then there was a, a whole other uh, world where it was um, specifically higher education work. I was lucky to, to manage um, that effort for that firm for uh, initially for uh, all of Canada. And, and then it, 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 it all kind of uh, took me into air various places and so on. And so there was a point for, for me when I figured out that I don't think I want direction from anybody else anymore. I felt I was at a point in my career that, that I, you know, suddenly, oh, I am going to launch. I, and it just occurred to me like overnight, there was a whole series of things that kind of happened for me. Um, and so I came out uh, of that system with a certain lens and a certain level of um, comfort with decent scale projects, ones that were complicated in terms of uh, user groups and so on. And then I did what, like how um, I remember on your podcast, or I've heard this before, Bjarke Ingels started out as kind of uh, a, a little bit of a, a person without the level of experience that he was able to talk himself into. And I think he hired the, the level of experience he needed once he needed that. In some ways, I was the inverse. I had uh, a level of experience that was no match for an upstart firm. It's very difficult for one person operation to say, I want to do a, a giant research laboratory at a university, right? But I found a part who was actually um, a small practitioner um, and had, you know, the, the insurance figured out, the certificate of practice figured out, the bookkeeping figured out, all that kind of stuff. And, and that was for us a really good match. Um, and then we brought others into the fold. Uh, and I suppose it's, came out of the lineage of that uh, large firm experience I had had where I had seen people of various expertise and disciplines um, and the value of that, having that internally to be able to tap on somebody's shoulder and say, can you 
just do something that I don't have any expertise in and, and you know, uh, um, grabbing that individual for a short period of time for, for something intensely. And so that, that was the genesis, but also stepping back to that experience at that time, um, you know, whenever it was 15 years ago in this part of the world, uh, private sector, um, multifamily housing work, which was kind of the, the vehicle for a lot of practices here was unfulfilling for me for a mm-hmm. whole variety of reasons. Um, and I specifically, uh, and my partners, we set out to do something other than that. that. That was an area also of the market that was very well served here. There were lots of people that really knew how to do that and how to uh, find um, not only a skill set in it, but a passion for it. And, and we, we found something that was opposite. We, we had an interest in other areas and a skill set that was uh, work best in other areas. And so that was so, the, so, the thing. So was it a case then, was it with Robert that you co-founded? Uh, John. Uh, John Wall. John. It was with John. Yep. Yep. So John so John was the, the practitioner that had the smaller aspects yep. all up and running. And then you guys combined forces and then Robert and Shane, was it? Uh, I, yeah, it was Rob, Shane, and at the time it was Susan. And uh, and then there's Teresa. And it, so there's a whole variety of people that kind of came into the group and, and some of branched out into different directions and, and so on. So it, um, it's a, a loose gel. I'll, I'll describe it that way of, of things that kind of come into the mm-hmm. gel for a while and then they go on and spawn and, and do other things and, and all that stuff. But Great. Great. And, and so when you first started, how were you bringing in projects? What were the, what was the, the first kind of way that you were able to market yeah. yourselves and actually get get up and running yeah we started with nothing uh I, I didn't take any work with me from my previous firm or anything like that we started cold mm-hmm. um dining room table on john's john's house and mm-hmm. um uh what did we have to do really nothing and um but you know luck serendipity there was a couple of things that that happens it's it's a reasonable starting story and i oh boy i was lucky so uh <laughs> as i was leaving my pre I love starter stories from, from my peers because they are all fascinating. So for us, um, there was, uh, I went to a conference on higher education, um, architecture, and I sat down outside of these conference sessions and I was planning out what I was going to do for the next couple of days. And somebody sat down next to me as she was going through her program and we just got chatting of, oh, this looks interesting. What are you going to go and see? And so on. And then we introduced ourselves. And, um, she said, I am Karen Hearn. I'm the head of facilities for this university. And I like, oh my God, I've been trying to meet you for years. <laughs> and, and, uh, she said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, this is me and here's my business card. But in, uh, a month's time, I'm not going to be there anymore. And I'm actually going to take my family on holiday for a couple of months and just decompress. And then I'm going to watch something new. And she said, that's interesting. I want you to come and talk to me um, when you're back. And so this was a, a person that uh, in my former firm, we couldn't seem to get a position in with. And ultimately there was a personality issue with, you know, within my firm that, and, and there just was never a fit. Mm. And so a couple of months later, I, I uh, was sitting in uh, their office and another person within that organization walked through the door who I knew from another um, uh, uh municipal government. I said, you're, you're working here. And he said, yeah, great to see you. (laughs) And so, you know, there was an immediate couple of connections. And then a third thing, which was like the, the, not the nail in the coffin. What is the, the opposite of that? It was the, whatever the, the, the thing that both of my on the table (laughs) Yeah, yeah, Um, on her desk was a white paper that I had been part of in my previous firm that for an academic journal and she said oh this is very interesting you just uh, were an author on this and i said oh my god like the stars have just aligned here yeah yeah and she said what are you interested in and um and i said well i i gave the the elevator pitch of of what my firm was at that point which was a very short pitch i can assure you we just wanted to do anything right and she said what do you want to do and i said i want to do you know i but and she saw my cv she saw my my background And, you know, there was some significant projects there. And I said, I want to do your smallest project and I want to do it really well. 
And she said, that is something I've got. And two weeks later, we started on a, a project at the university and I continue to work for that university today. Wow. Um, and, and yeah, it was in some ways blind luck. In some ways it was um, maybe careful positioning from the the large firm that I was with, you know, that was the, my name was known and, and the white paper were landed on her desk and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, hmm. um, serendipity, luck and, and good fortune. So. And, and how big is the firm now? Uh, we're in the 30 person mark. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's been a pretty even and steady growth, um, over the years. It's, it, you know, you generally pick up a couple of people each year. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's a comfy size. And um, so there's there's thirty people, four partners. Mm -hmm. um, how is the team kind of structured internally? Yeah, yeah sure. Like how how would you how would you describe the the, the hierarchical hierarchy if there is one, uh, yeah. and how do decisions and visions get manifest throughout the throughout the practice? Uh, I suppose like every upstart, we were very flat for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, in the last uh, five years or so, we realized that depth is required for us to continue to do what we're doing. Um, and so, you know, there's, uh, it's actually three partners, three owners, there's an associate principal, um, and then there is uh, a, a tier of uh, a couple of senior associates and, and new associates underneath us, and then, and then the rest of the mix. Um, and so... It's, uh, and I suspect after that, the, the, the structure I think is fairly conventional. We do as mm -hmm. many things as we can in, in a conventional manner as possible so, so that we can focus on the unconventional things. We try to keep as many things as possible predictable. Um, and so the, the leadership is, uh, really the three with some advisors uh, around us for, um, design director, marketing director, uh, administrative support and, and, um, all the, the, the business keeping and all that kind of stuff. So it, it really, the, the, the leadership and the decision-making is, is primarily the three with advisors, but you know, everybody that comes into the, uh, the leadership group, they're in, they're, they're part of that group because they have a diversity of experience and, um, and a useful opinion because, oh my God, you cannot see it all yourself. You cannot do it all as a, as a, uh, I, I, I admire and am deeply anxiety ridden by soul practitioners or, or groups that have figured out at least on the surface to, to pretend that there is a, a single leader. I don't know how that works at all. And I find that, um, I could never sleep at night with the, all the myriad of decisions that you have to go through. So it is, going to say a small bureaucracy, but there is, it's a small level of, of management. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons that the groups we work with may identify with us that there is, um, we're kind of peers. We're kind of like them. Um, how do you, uh, um, nowadays, like in terms of the, the partner's roles, how would you describe what the partner's roles are comparatively to senior associates to you know, maybe more junior members of the, of the team. How would you, yeah. How, how would you describe what the, what the kind of core components or domains are as yeah. a partner? Do you still get to design? Do you still have the your involvement in projects or? Yeah. Uh, not a lot of golf being played here where we are, the partners are still actively, um, on the, well, to varying degrees on the tools, if you will. Um, and, uh, very much. I'll back up. There is a characteristic to the the way that our firm does, for example, business development, marketing, and so on, is we are the the kinds of people we work for and the kinds of opportunities we pursue allow us to actually spend a lot of time practicing our craft. It's different than my peers and, and my former firm. I re recall and I see others spending a lot of time actually figuring out how to get more work to do and things like that. I, we have, um, I think we're quite lucky in that my partners and I, we spend, you know, it's two thirds to three quarters of our day dealing directly with projects, directly with, 
uh, issues, either uh, drawing them in some cases, going through all the the myriad of decisions, and so on. So we're, um, I suppose, we have crafted a position so that we can continue to practice the craft that we enjoy. Now, on the flip mm. side, on the flip side, and listen, I'm a student of your podcast, and I know that there will be a, a whole series of people saying, oh man, you've got to get out of that. You've got to be actually doing more hunting and gathering and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, I do think that public is at an inflection point and mm-hmm. there is a, a mode where we're going to need to grow into enabling work as opposed to doing work. I think one of your guests said that or something to that effect. Um, and and, and I, as a student, every morning I get up in the, and I think, you know, on that podcast, they would have said, you know, you're not, you have no business drawing one. Although I really enjoy it, but you, you you cannot do that and pretend that you're going to feed, you know, an organization of 30 plus people. And the only reason we're 30 people at the moment is we're out of space. We can't, we can't physically grow anymore. There, there is, there is, we have more opportunities than we have capacity for. Um, so we, right. we, I know we are at an inflection point and as soon as our lease is up, we'll, we'll, we'll step into something else and, and, and we'll continue to grow. A- having said that, that all depends on the outcome of certain uh, elections in this part of the world. And we'll see which way um, uh, the decision makers in, in this part of the world continue to, to lean towards, right? Exactly. Um, so, so it's quite interesting that you say that as well. Like, you know, the, there would be a lot of people when you get to a firm size of 30, like your role as a leader starts to shift a little bit. And it's not, uh, that can be a bit, uh, what's the word um either disruptive or it's not what you were expecting as an architect and mm-hmm. now you're trying to facilitate design you know you're trying to facilitate great design through other people and yep. as you were saying you're not you're not necessarily on the on the tools um yep. what, what have been some of the major shifts that you've seen growing from like two of you and then maybe to 10 persons to now to 30 um, well, each of those have got their own kind of unique set of problems. What, how have the problems evolved or shifted throughout the business? Or like, you know, what kind of problems were you dealing with that you're not dealing with now? And oh yeah, that kind I of mean, evolution. Well, classic stuff, right? And so it's two individuals on a dining room table doing everything. Mm-hmm. And then it's three partners on two dining room tables doing everything. And then, it, and then all those kinds of issues associated with flat organizations, right? We, we, mm-hmm. we, we felt all of that. Um, and it really, it, it was again at that, that moment, uh, five odd years ago where we decided, oh my God, I, I could just not get up every morning and, and continue to run flat out on every fire. That is just so unproductive. And our, our clients were like, you know, this invoice is three months old that you just sent me. Or, you know, it's already super stale. Like, and you just get this together, please, right? So mm, yeah. at a point, you cannot just pretend you're, you're going to do all of that anymore. Um, and so um, with the promotion of really key people within to give us the, that ability to hire two administrators to, to deal with keeping all of the lights on and, and all of that stuff. Um, and one key decision was uh, a design director. Um, so that's a person who is unencumbered with any client contact whatsoever, uh, although he will uh, at his discretion when he wants to have a, a sense of, you know, who's, who's driving certain decisions, he will step into certain conversations and, and see them. Um, and so just that as a single person on design quality and control, um, who touches every project so that you know, no longer do the, the, the firm owners have to say, you know, this group over here, you should go and talk to them. That that person now is the conduit across all projects. And, and so that, and that has freed up, he's just way better at all those things than I am, for example. And, and my, my partner would say the same thing. So that helps free up bandwidth for partners and it improves quality. And it um, it just means that you don't have to be there every day looking over the shoulder of, of whatever. So it, that, that was a great move for us. Um, and I think we'll continue to, to build that kind of depth and thickness. Um, it, and in a similar capacity, we have a marketing director and all those kinds of things. So people that are just focused on those things. 
just, just yeah. going into that role, that, that that's really interesting. The design, so the design director role, what they're they're somebody who's got like a, they're not working directly on the project, but rather they're managing the quality of the project. So are they setting like a kind of precedent of what the architectural language is, or or setting what the design manifesto is? So they're I assume that they're an architect themselves, or a lot of with a lot of experience. That's right. And and Shane is a super bright guy and, and mm-hmm. has has a touch with people as well, which is very important, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, he is he's a master tactician. Like like any good chess player, he has, you know, one one attack move and he has two to three counters that, that if the you know, if the project zigs when you think it's gonna zag, he's like, Oh, no problem, we're gonna go this direction. I I, I know where to go. So it's it really reduces the stress it reduces like from running a business it, it it makes you not every decision is you're not throwing all the dice on every move he's just somebody who is unencumbered with all of the fire hose of stuff that it takes to, to run a business and run a project it, he is deliberately we've removed him from that and he's just got clear thinking going on and, and then he's um Partners and associates and the team members still are, you know, they're driving the project, but he is, he's entrusted with all major decisions. And, and you know, it, when he is generally put a position forward, nine out of 10 of those are going to go that direction. It, it doesn't mean he rules with impunity or anything like that. It's, it, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a measured, um, kind of position and he's keenly, uh, uh, politically astute, um, he has great social intelligence, so he can, you know, he can read any room. He's a very quick study, so it's it's yeah. that, that for us has been really enabling. Amazing. So, so he's not actually involved then in any of the production work, but more like a kind of design advisor, where he might sit down and he probably has the capacity then to be able to 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 put his hand or direction on like a a large number of different projects in a yep. given day, for example. Yep. And yeah, I'm assuming he can probably draw and sketch very well, and yeah. and, and has a, a whole repertoire of amazing communication tools. Yeah, yeah, he's a Swiss Army knife of an architect. He's he's got a tool for everything. He's good. Is that the kind of role that you could see yourself um, having another director like that? Um, yeah, because because that right. that that's a really very thoughtful way of managing and and maintaining design um like quality and consistency and also yeah. stops a practice at a certain s- scale starting to splinter into lots of different factions if you like yeah you've got it exactly he, it's it's an important role for keeping culture but it's also uh there's a bandwidth issue there as well right that we have mm-hmm. to be careful it, it's you, you can't keep tapping him for every day and i do I, I tap on him for all sorts of decisions because he's a trusted advisor, right? And, and just mm-hmm. by by scale and um, by discipline, I think it's going to be logical that we'll add others that do that and complement, you know, and, and they may be, you know, an interior uh, director or, or uh, others, right? It, it just literally at this moment at that inflection point thing, we're just simply out of desks to be able to, to, to grow into the other positions, mm-hmm. right? And this, the, the design director um role was it something that he grew into from being an architect or did he come from outside and then kind of land as this over oversight figure yeah yeah um he came from outside um another organization in town a very strong firm and he Mm -hmm. uh, and started as a project architect and it was and and it was quickly he was uh, a, a trusted advisor in several arenas, um, but we were literally we were interviewing somebody, and I had a thought for a design director role. We were interviewing another outside candidate, and he was sitting through the interview, and ultimately that interview wasn't successful. And he said, "That sounds like a really good job. Do you think I could do that?" <laughs> and I laughed and I said, "Oh my god, I didn't even see that. Like I was so blind to it." And it's just like anything; a good advisor can help point out the obvious, right? And mm-hmm. uh, and that was that worked for him for for so many different reasons um for who he was for personally as well and and, and all that so it was uh kind of like the starting story it's another thing of serendipity and sometimes you just don't see the obvious or or 
it takes a moment of the lightning strikes to to shake you out of oh yeah this is super obvious why don't we just do that yeah yeah i th- i think that's a great way of you know managing design in a in a practice where you've got one of the the partners or like a high level design director who's able to come in and problem solve and be strategic and tactical and direct um and then aren't encumbered with the sort of uh the the grind work of loads and loads of production but are a very key resource for the rest of the the design yeah. team and imagine yeah. as well it's also quite an aspirational position where there's lots of other designers architects in the firm who would love to be also doing that so it kind of creates a nice pull um yeah. of of sort of experience where people want to be moving in their careers absolutely yeah no it's and it, it, he is such a resource and people see him as that mm-hmm. yeah there's there's a great respect and again it comes back to that social intelligence he has so he just has a great way of delivering what ultimately might be a scathing analysis of, of some work that's in front of him but but he's, he does it with you know just acumen and and and, and real sensitivity so so the, the the teams are always come out of these um sessions and the, the team will have a touch point with him two to three times per week um so it's continuous um, there, there are micro adjustments. Sometimes there's some macro or, or big turns in direction, but but generally they're they're always course directions as opposed to radical flipping the the table kind of thing. In, in terms of maintaining your finances and profitability on a project, there's quite a um, a shift that a practice goes through from you know working with five people up to thirty people, and now you've got numerous projects and. You know, financial project manager management becomes much more of a, a sophisticated beast or can do. Um, what has been your kind of evolution around actually, you know, m- keeping projects on budget and managing the fees and actually setting fees and making sure that there's enough profit allocated to? Yeah, I know. And, it, and this is where I think about being a student of the show. It, we're seeking to continually improve that is what I would put forward. And probably for a long time, we operated with a, a simple bookkeeper and, and all of that, and probably too long, right? That stretched out mm-hmm. from the, the days where that makes sense as a as a startup. Um, and now it's a, it's a two-person organization. There's an accountant in the wings and all of that good stuff. And so we have people that are looking specifically at, you know, forecasting all the resource needs, looking at um, every week, every Monday morning, we touch on resourcing. Every Monday morning, we talk well, as an office, first of all, I'll back up. As an office, every Monday morning we meet and we talk about the the week's activities, deadlines, and all that kind of stuff. But we also talk about resourcing, which projects um, have a push that week. Are there um, insufficient resources on, on one? And is there a surplus on another? Then we take that information into uh, an internal meeting of just the, the principals and associates. And we, we, um, we try to take any action that we heard out of that conversation and and allocate resources right that's our major expense as a group um mm-hmm. and that administrative team sits in that resourcing meeting and says you know they're, they're, they're tracking all of that and ultimately you know we have software now that'll tell us if there's a disconnect that oh those resources don't match what you've got um in the bank so to speak for that project so you need to figure out something else and and our design director sits in on that conversation so that he is attuned to Oh, this project, you know, there's, we're, we're coming to the end of a phase. We need to be finding, um, solutions that quickly come to a conclusion as opposed to opening, you know, at times projects open and, and it's a wide open, let's, let's look at the, where the rubber meets the sky kind of thing, or it's, yeah. uh, uh, or we need to really dial in and, and, and get through this particular milestone. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. It's a, that, and, and that's always a challenge of capacity, right? That that mm-hmm. information flow and capacity to to have everybody knowing all things at all times is we're at a point where that's not necessarily viable in a in a firm of this size. That 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 is a, a um, that's one of the things as a as a small firm that you have to let go as you grow. That not everybody will know everything all the time. I, colleague of mine calls it the doomsday scenario he's he's got a practice it's a similar size and he he can't sleep at night unless he knows how to do everything if something happened tomorrow another pandemic or whatever he feels that he needs to be able to go in in the morning 
and to in, in his mind to an entirely empty studio, turn on the lights, get the plotter running, get the drawings going, get the coffee maker going. And, and he, he feels that he needs that. And, but then there is the, the flip side of, I was frustrated by the coffee maker this morning. I barely got the, the tech going to get onto the, the thing. So I'm, I'm at that moment where I'm, I'm having to let go more and more of these things, which at times is obviously frustrating. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it's also, I mean, on, um, you know, from a logical point of view, it delegation and letting go of these tasks seems, well, of course, it just makes a lot of sense. And you're, you're right. here, you know, us on the, on the podcast here and other, um, business commentators will be talking about the importance of delegation, but actually it's like emotionally, it's not always straightforward because particularly when there's so many aspects of the job that you love or, you know, architects, I, I typically find a the, the, one of the the disadvantages architects have is number one being generalists and number two being you know very intelligent and very talented at lots of different things and yeah. are able to normally pick things up and get a, a, a pretty good competency at a multitude of different skills and actually yeah. sometimes in business that that can be certainly from the, a, a production standpoint that can be problematic because now yeah you want to do all these different things and you've got an intellectual interest in all these different components and now you're being involved in all this kind of stuff and then to let go of something is is difficult you know i'll, I'll often speak to practices and they're pursuing a particular type of work for no other reason than oh you know I mean, even at their own detriment so it might be projects that are kind of costing the, the business money to actually participate in but yeah the uh, uh, one of the partners is fond of doing them or they have a, a you know a, 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 an, an intellectual interest in doing them that's like okay but is it working for the business to be able to con to to do to do that what sorts of things have you uh, you and the team and the other your other principals kind of been learning to let go of or have struggled to let go of or or some things you're just like actually, you know what we're not supposed to let go of this thing at all uh, well, we were, oh man, it, it's one of the things that comes with, uh, working for the, the earlier statement or characteristic of our firm. We have a very short client list who we do a lot of things for. And one of the, the downsides of that, it's a blessing and a curse, right? So they'll call you for everything, which is great because they're calling, but mm -hmm. on the downside, you can be doing really menial projects that have miserable multipliers and ultimately your staff is like, why are we doing this? And, 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 yeah. and you keep saying, well, we're serving a really important client and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But at a certain point, there might not be anything good with that. Um, mm -hmm. and so for us to be able to say no to these really valued clients that we work very hard to, to get to a point of, of total service for them, um, that has been, uh, something we've had to learn in the last few years in particular. Like we've had some that are just such a pull on the resources of the organization at an, a point you have no business servicing a small job when you're at a certain scale you you really should be leaving that for the the next uh, batch of uh, young firms and, and small firms to, to grow through there's a uh, just a, a natural sweet spot for every organization on projects and and for us it was the um it took a while to see that 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 we just cannot service these things uh, efficiently do them well, do them with joy, and, and uh, ultimately, maybe actually to our detriment, to be servicing these things not particularly well, right? On your website, there's a number of very interesting kind of research papers and and studies and the economics of timber mass building, or or I think it was the timber timber structures or some something in that kind of uh, domain. Is research a active component of your of your business and how do you ensure that you've got the resource to be able to, to do that? Or how do you allocate resource for people to be able to do, um, research projects that perhaps don't have a direct, uh, yeah, revenue sure. stream associated with them for sure. Um, and yes, it, it is an active, um, part of the practice. It's something that I saw in my, um, the practice that I was mentored in, it was a part of that um our firm's portfolio um but i'll be totally candid with you it, it it's something that um i think 
I'm one of those architects and my partner might be as well that has a certain attention to deficit disorder, right? That, that if a project is not being built, um, it may become less interesting. Um, and so for, for us, really the key for research it is our team is really important and we've been blessed. We have some uh, amazing team members within our organization that, that really have the temperament and the kind of cadence for research work. It, um, yeah, some of the characteristics of, of people at public, like we have a really thriving Dungeons and Dragons cohort that, that works on, on D&D games in the evening. Like that didn't exist 25 years ago. Nobody was like that kind of bookishness or, or, mm -hmm. Uh, space for activities of the mind, I'll put it. Um, and we have a group of uh, people within the organization that enjoy data, that enjoy um, uh, problem solving in a, in a deep way, and also have seen that these kind of projects can actually push the bigger project, the, the, the big architecture forward in a way that is really compelling. Um, and so, uh, yes, we do have, uh, a group, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm part of it. My part is part of it as well that, that are looking out for opportunities to help push various efforts forward and along. So it is an active part of, of the, the practice, but it's not like a, a research department. It is not that. Right. And, uh, I, I've seen that in other organizations where that at times can become a, a financial burden within the organization. So we're, we're careful to ensure that it's, um, it does not get in the way of more conventional modes of practice. It, it is a supplement to, um, conventional modes of practice so that it's, we're not, uh, there's no pressure to go out and find research and, and make it, make the, the projects happen. We, we find the projects generally come to us um and and or we may find them through through the kind of rfp system and so on and say you know what this particular thing aligns well with what we're doing on this other project and we we find the fit and we go for it ultimately you, you um research is best i think done um if you've already got that expertise through work that you're doing or yeah. it's a natural a natural step to something that would improve what you're doing and um I guess as well with some of the studies that you, when you get to do, they become marketing collateral in a sense, and they're things that you're able to kind of establish thought leadership uh, around and drive other conversations and start other conversations with prospective clients. And yeah, yeah, it it, it definitely does that. It's part of um, conversations start whether it's by clients or. Um, maybe uh, as a recruitment tool as well by what, it, what are you doing that's different? What's within your organization that is uh, a differentiator or a particular piece of expertise that you have? And, and obviously, um, published research is uh, a, an easy tool to do that. Um, and so that has been useful for us. Um, definitely um, on the recruitment side, um, team members, prospective team members come to us and they're aware of that research and and you know it's a bit of a litmus test if they've got the the appetite for that and you know with you can quickly through a few questions uh, discern whether they've actually um, digested the 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 work or not uh, and then for uh, on the, the the other part of uh, the cost equation the, the marketing side it can be uh, a an interest or an avenue for conversations with others that you might not otherwise know yeah. so you know. Did you, did you know the following or, you know, we've just been part of X, Y, and Z, and that can obviously open a door. I, that, you, it's interesting that you mentioned a little bit about, uh, how it can become a recruitment tool or it can play a role in kind of attracting the right team members, or it plays a role in kind of just, uh, being a qualifier for the kind of person who you might be taking on into the business going from you know, a, a couple of you to a practice of 30, one of the biggest obstacles that many practices will face is exactly that hiring part and actually yep. finding good talent. And then once you found good talent, how do you stop them from leaving? What have been some of your strategies or insights or 
you know, what, what advice could you give to some of the, the audience listening here of, of how to find talented people and how to make them stick around? Yeah, of course. Um, I suppose for us, hiring people that are good at what you're not, I think is also really mm. one thing. I strive for um, so that's the research department. You know, they they are. I didn't say it's a department, but the the, the people that that I've got within the organization that that are are interested in that kind of work, there's a space for them because uh, they are able to carve out a, a piece of territory that's theirs. Um, and the um, helping can to retain them is to ensure that there is a both a, a reasonable opportunity for more research opportunities, any uh, outreach from that or any publicity or presentations or things like that. Those the individuals involved in the studies are the ones that are doing that. So it's they're like many projects, right? They have a, a, a short design or a short kind of production phase, presentation phase, and then an after phase. And, and what's interesting about them is they can be quite uh, visible. They can be uh, generate quite a lot of interest from media and so on. And so it's a tremendously rewarding thing for somebody um, in the kind of early part of their career to have uh, that under their belt. So it is a compelling thing. Um, and it's been uh, recently, we've just had um, a study we did on um, uh, an exit strategy, um, single stair exiting in uh, British Columbia, which was uh, as of August 2024, it was adopted by the British Columbia Building Code and is part of code now. It is uh, something wow. that we were part of that is actually uh, manifest now in code. And uh, full circle, on Tuesday, I took my first phone call from somebody who heard my team on the radio and said, you guys know all about this. I've got a building that, or I've got a project that I want to do this on. Can you get me a proposal like on Wednesday? So it, it really has come full circle on that, um, which is super amazing. Um, and that started with a, a tiny little study from uh, British Columbia Housing Corporation. And it was, um, it really was a small little modest effort at the beginning. And, and uh, there are many people around these kind of projects. So there is all kinds of important other authors and, and experts and all that kind of stuff. But we were, we were part of that solution. So it's, it's tremendously rewarding for for somebody who runs an organization that's part of that tremendously rewarding for my team members and it's going to have real positive change in the industry so that's a, that's Amazing. a good win yeah very cool yeah. um i think that's probably the, uh, a good place for us to conclude the conversation here i, I feel like i could sit and uh, speak with you for uh, for another for another couple of hours but thank you so much for um, sharing your insights here and some of your experience and the way that you've um, built public architecture with your uh, other principals and the, and the team. It's been really fantastic to hear your story. So thank Thanks you so very much. much. Yeah, I'm a student of the show. I enjoy your work a lot. So keep it up and uh, good talking to you and maybe we'll get a chance to talk again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take it easy. And that's a wrap. Hey, Enix Sears here. And I, I have a request since you are a listener here of the Business of Architecture podcast. Ryan and I, we love putting this podcast together. We love sharing information as much as we can glean from all the other industries that we're a part of to bring it back to empower you as an architect and a designer. And one thing that helps us in our mission is the growth of this podcast, simply because it helps other architects stand for more of their value, spreads the business information that we're sharing to empower architects together so architects, designers, engineers can really step into their greatness, whatever that looks like for each individual. And so here, my, my simple ask is for you to join us and be part of our community by doing the following, heading over to iTunes and leaving a review of the podcast. And as an expression of our sincere thanks, we would like to give you a free CEU course that can get you one professional development unit, but more importantly, we'll give you a very solid and firm foundation on your journey to becoming a profitable and thriving architect. So here's the process for that. After you leave us a review, send an email to support at businessofarchitecture.com. Let us know the username that you use to leave the review, and we will send you that free training. On the training, you'll discover what 99% of architecture firm owners wish they would have known 20 years ago. And the other 1%, well, 
they just didn't even know that they didn't know. Head over to iTunes and leave us a review now. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.